Hello and welcome everybody to the first Q&A on Chess24. I'm Jan Gustafsson and our first expert Super Grandmaster Specialist Ask Him Anything will be none other than Mr. Peter Swidler. We're delighted to have him here. Before we get into the questions and let Peter say anything, I'm not really planning to let him say anything to be completely honest. I want to apologize for not doing this live. We're having a technical issue. I'm hoping you guys still get your questions answered and can enjoy the show. Peter, welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, Jan. And uh, I'm not sure I can sustain this volume, but I will, I will do my very best. And uh, as long as you keep the, the show running, I think everybody will be happy. Or at least mm -hmm. we hope so. We do hope so. And we did get a lot of questions, which surprised us, because frankly, you don't know that much. I mean, like, you know four no, or five I'm, things yeah. and we get like 30 questions. I, I've uh, scrolled through a little bit uh, to, to prepare myself for uh, what's coming. And yes, uh, I think people are expecting uh, a lot from uh, somebody whose area of expertise is, you know, uh, TV and possibly cricket. And, uh, nah. Of course, we're joking. He is a super grandmaster, seven times Russian champion, all the good stuff. Let's jump straight into the questions, shall we? Sure. That's what we're here for. Mm. Shall we bring up the first question? It's by Mr. Tractatus. Dear Peter, obviously opponents at your level are always well prepared. What are your considerations regarding opening preparations? Here I am thinking about the pros and cons of one, choosing to play your favorite opening, although the opponent most likely will be well prepared, and two, choosing to play an unexpected opening although you might not know all the different finesses as good as in your favorite opening. Well, this uh, has become a m more of an issue recently. Uh, I mean, uh, I've always had this, this choice, uh, as I think uh, does uh, pretty much any top player these days. But uh, since recording the Grunfeld series, this has become a major concern because uh, uh, to my slight amazement, uh, it seems to have been reasonably well received, and I have no idea who has seen it and who hasn't. And uh, uh, playing the Grunfeld with Black these days, uh, there's this additional level of danger because uh, people uh, might know uh, even more about it than they do normally. But uh, I think it depends on your feeling uh, on the day. It also depends on who exactly you're playing because. Uh, uh, yes, people. Uh, when people, let's say, play white against me, they they do expect a certain range of openings, and they do prepare against them. But uh, you know, I fear some people's preparation more than others. Let's let's put it like this. I'm not I'm not going to name names, but there are <laughs> there are people out there uh, who uh, y you expect uh, to just kill you outright if you get caught in their preparation, and there are people out there who don't really aim for that, who play. Uh, who, who aim to uh, to get a, a playable position more than uh, j just win the game uh, straight out of the opening. So a lot of factors uh, go into this, and uh, also the way you're feeling, uh, as I said, the way you're feeling on the day. But uh, um, generally speaking, you do need to know a lot of sidelines to, to be able to play them you know, more than once per tournament. So I generally tend to stick to my, to my own stuff uh, in most cases. So bottom line, it is all our fault for publishing the Grunfeld series. That's what I take from this. Uh, well, yes, uh, that is what I expected to, to be the, the, the major, the major uh, theme of that Fair answer. Enough. Let's move to our friend Schachspieler. He has three questions. I'm not sure if that's legal, but I think we can get number one out of the way quickly. Are you related with Bast Bastian Pastevka? Well, I had to Google who that is, and uh, I don't really see the resemblance. I'm told there is some resemblance in some of the photos, but not the ones that Google provided me at first search, and I didn't really go any deeper. You do kind of look alike. No idea who that is, not my relative. Fair enough. Question number two, one E4 question mark. One E4 exclamation mark. I thought you were more of a one G three, one knight F three. That's that's mark. that's me. I'm a I'm a, a an old man who uh, has no energy to to do any proper opening work. No, I th I still think one E four is a very decent move, but uh, it's uh, it's run into some problems recently, and you need to uh, you need to work on chess a bit. That's annoying. Yeah, I know. Let's go to a more cheerful question. 
Number three, what do you think about Loom? I think there was a Quest game I played when I was a little kid called Loom, but I'm not sure if that's what be what's being referred it's to here. It's a LucasArts adventure. I yeah, that's... I loved it when I played it, but uh, there was about 25 years ago. I don't remember much. I remember it was uh, one of the things I really enjoyed playing. There were uh, bits of it which were very, very nice. I, I thought there were the, some of the concepts were very original. Legend of Kirandia as well, you know, blast from the past. I, I haven't really returned to this material. I've never played those, but I recently got Monkey Island 1 and 2 as apps on my phone. It's ah, no, great. No. Yeah, I had to I had to install some kind of uh, some kind of MS DOS uh, simulator to uh, to to play Monkey Island, and I got my kids to play Monkey Island, which I was very happy about. Uh, Passing on the knowledge. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Thomas R. What is he saying? Dear Peter, simple but possibly tricky questions. Number one: What are your remaining goals in chess? Yeah, that, that I, I did see that, and I was kind of dreading that for for the past five hours. Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure. I still. Uh, why am I on, always answering this question honestly? I want to become world champion, Thomas. Beautiful. <laughs> I have no idea why I always try to answer this question as if it's a real. It's a real question. <laughs> it's a. It's a mistake. I must. I must do something about it. Which brings us to number two. If you know, for how long will you keep playing? I certainly don't want you to retire. Thank but you. Others, that's his words, not mine. <laughs> but others hinted at retirement around the age of 40, an oh. age you start to approach. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, well, I have no set date in mind. Uh, I think uh, people who have said something about, I mean, I remember a Kramnik interview where he said something about playing until he's 40 and then gradually phasing it out. Uh, I think mainly, you can't really just set an age and say, okay, I will quit the moment you know, the clock strikes, strikes 12 on uh, whatever the day may be. Uh, the moment you feel you're no longer competitive at a level at which you're uh, kind of used to yourself being competitive at, you, you sort of begin seriously considering it. And uh, I don't think I'm there yet, to be honest, even though my, uh, a couple of my recent performances uh, may have prompted this question. Nah, I think you still got a couple good months in you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hoping for, considering the fact that I'm, you know, starting a reasonably important tournament day after tomorrow. Oh, Bill Ball is coming up. Yes. Dr. Boki, next question. We have a fast pace here. We got a lot of questions. Dear Peter, what are the last five chess books you read or bought? Well, uh, that's a tricky one because. Uh, to my honest regret, I, at some point I almost gave up on chess literature for whatever reason. I thought you know the whole thing kind of moved online and you didn't really need books anymore. And I think uh, that was a huge mistake because uh, as far as I could judge from reading the reviews and talking to people, we are living in a golden age of chess books and there's a lot of really good stuff being, uh, being uh, produced. And uh, I definitely bought the, the, the Avruch books on the Grunfeld and uh, they will be in the list. but. Uh, it will be hard to name five because uh, I think if, if I wanted to reach the, the, the magical number five, I would really have to go back a long, long way. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the stuff I, uh, I read recently I, I got as files, so uh, that probably also doesn't count. But uh, mainly the theoretical books, sadly. I think uh, there's also a lot of uh, very good stuff which is not strictly uh, theory related and uh, we, I maybe should be. Do you read Kasparov's books, the predecessors and the... I, I, sh I should at some point do that. I, I, I read all of, all of Kasparov's earlier books, you know, the one he wrote when he was uh, still uh, <laughs> writing them in Russian. And uh, those were excellent, but uh, somehow the predecessors, there's just too many of them and I never got to... As I said, when they were coming out, I was the, you know, in this phase where I was uh, just not reading chess books at all. I was reading a lot about chess, but not chess books as such. And uh, I, I'm fairly convinced that, in, especially in, in case of the predecessors, this was a huge mistake because uh, people whose opinion I respect uh, value them greatly. Yeah, I like them too. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, what, what we got next? <clears throat> Which one is it? Ted Lawyer. He's asking, does it feel different to play the current world champion versus other strong players? Who's the current world champion? The Norwegian guy, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's him. 
are the current top five players stronger than top five 30 or 40 years ago when you were a young man? I'm guessing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, playing Magnus is uh, very, very challenging, but also very interesting. And uh, somehow, uh, it, I don't feel uh, that he is my most uh, awkward opponent somehow, even though, I mean, it's very, very hard playing him and it will obviously become, you know, harder if I, if I still get to play him, which is, which is not a given. But, uh, I mean, uh, my earlier success will be very, very hard to replicate, but somehow uh, I feel I'm doing okay when I play him. I don't feel as hopeless uh, as I, let's say, used to feel when I was playing uh, Vlad in the olden days. You're being humble again. You have a plus score against Magnus, right? Yeah, I know. But uh, the recent trend is uh, I, actually the results even recently have been okay. But uh, you, the, the game in Stavanger is still very fresh in my mind. Uh, <laughs> it was a draw, right? It was a draw. Yes, it was a fighting draw where you know White even had winning chances toward the end, uh, which would really be embarrassing for everyone concerned. As for uh, the uh, top five now against the top five. Uh, 40 years ago, if you take the top five, if you take uh, you know the the very creme de la creme, so to speak, I think the difference is not uh, significant, or maybe there's there's none at all, because uh, then you are only taking the the, the very best of the uh, of, of, of you know from a couple of generations. But in general, I think the level increased. I think it's very very hard to argue that uh, uh, chess is uh, better. Chess is being played now than uh, than has been uh, had been played before. Uh, I don't know if the difference is so marked against uh, if you compare uh, current chess with uh, chess of the 70s and 80s. But if you compare it to uh, let's say 40s, 50s, 60s, I think the difference is uh, quite significant. What we got next, Mr. Penty? I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. Pan T is asking, Hi Peter, huge compliments for your video series on the Grunfeld Indian defense. Simply outstanding. Did you ever think of complementing it with a series about White's alternatives after D4 and F6 avoiding the Grunfeld? Amateur chess players, perhaps more than professional players, have to deal with notorious systems like Trompowski, London and College, just to name a few. It would be great to watch and listen to what a world-class player thinks. Thanks. Well, uh, that's a, actually a, a kind of a very nice, uh, nice setup question for me in a way because uh, I grew up playing the Kole myself. I, I played the Kole almost exclusively until I was maybe 14 or 15 with great results for whatever reason. What is the Kole? Sorry, to interrupt. Basically, Meron, you, you, play, you play the Meron tempo up, which explains why it's not such a bad system. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you go uh, you go knight of three, d4 knight of three, uh, e3 bishop d3 c3 knight bd2. You, you keep the bishop on c1. I was never one for developing it uh, towards danger zones on f4 and g5, only against g6. Uh, but uh, it might be a decent idea. Yes, I'm not a huge specialist, let's say, on what to do against the tromp. To be honest, uh, I've always had uh, trouble figuring out what I should do against people playing the tromp. No, just play d5. No, uh, yes, uh, but uh, as a black player, you always feel somewhat challenged by the trump. You think, uh, what do I play to preserve, uh, you know, a double-edged position with winning chances? And if you, if if that is your aim, you might not equalize. There are there are many lines where black sort of. Uh, uh, looks for complications for the sake of complications in the trump, and uh, those are very, very dangerous potentially. So, uh, if you want to equalize, I'm fairly sure you can equalize there. But uh, if you want more, it becomes very interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, the Grunfeld in itself was such a huge project t trying to answer the actual question that uh, you know, by the time I was done with those videos, I was uh, uh, you know, an idea of doing uh, additional additional videos on the small stuff at the time did not appeal particularly. But uh, I might get back to that uh, at, a, at a later date. We'll take what we can get. So thanks, Panthe, for the suggestion. Sounds like a good idea to me. Oof, this next question, I can't even decipher. The first, the first, yeah, the first two words, I, I think, uh, considering that the, uh, the fact that the rest is in English, I, I, I think maybe Google Translate was, was helping there. But uh, it says hi, hi, Peter, in Russian, with no, mis okay. with no mistakes. And the first word is quite easy to make mistakes in. So uh, uh, kudos on, oh, I'm mispronouncing the that as well. The word starts with a three? No, it's a Z. 
Looks like a three to me. Yeah, but that's a, that's a Z, All yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on to the question. Cristiano is asking, I think you are a really strong player and I'm glad you're offering your knowledge to us. I don't know if I could watch live. Turns yeah. out you can't, but that's not your fault, but ours. Sorry about that again. He's on a flight at showtime. So, question time. You know, I like to answer 1c4 with 1e5, and I saw you played some good games against the other GMs. After c4, e5, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, knight c6, g3, knight d4, this might be time to bring up our chessboard. I'm yeah, not there's, sure there's actually people a can follow us. The, chess, the, the chessboard is available to us, and we even have had this question. Uh, uh, anticipated uh, c4 e5 knight of knight c3 knight f6 knight f3 knight c6 g3 mm -hmm. this is uh, a very topical line of course knight d4 uh, bishop g2 takes takes uh, I always played bishop b4 here I know I know bishop c5 exists but uh, I've spent quite a lot of time making uh, all the various sort of uh, subplots of bishop before work and I you know I'm very set in my ways in the in this uh, respect so I still think bishop b4 is fine, but there's uh, this... What about this line? Uh, how does it go? Yeah, it goes queen, queen b3. Yeah, queen b3. Uh, this, this, I think, is supposed to be the line uh, which uh, white pins his hopes on here. I'm not sure if you should start with castles uh, or knight a4, but basically we're talking about the same position. Knight a4 here, bishop b7, and d4, which I think was first played by ph uh, in... Uh, Nielsen play against Karana. Yeah, I, that, I, I played... I, that yeah. Game. I played, I played in the tournament, so that was actually uh, happening before my eyes. That was an, an NH uh, tournament of uh, young, young people against old people. I was playing for the old people, of course. Uh, and uh, this is a very serious try, and there, there have been some, some high-level games since. And uh, without, go, without going too much into detail, because I think this is, a, you know, this is actual live opening theory, which I might have to at some point use, but uh, I think the position after uh, e d4, rook d5, uh, rook d1, I'm sorry, c5, e3, uh, is holdable for black. But uh, white definitely gets a lot of play here. There's never any question of white being worse, but I think this is holdable for black. So uh, this doesn't refute the line and you can still play it, but uh, you do need to uh, have something against this idea. Thanks. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next question. <clears throat> Ikel is wondering, do you have any comments on why the great Tigran Petrosian had such exceptional results at playing against the Grunfeld? Yeah, I saw that question and I, I briefly considered actually looking up his results against the Grunfeld, but uh, I decided against it because I think I know the answer. And the answer you probably won't like because it's kind of simplistic, but I think the answer is simply he was better than his opponents. Uh, and generally uh, with White, uh, he had great results against the Dutch, fantastic results against the King's Indian. I think this mainly had to do with the fact that he was playing people who were worse than him. And uh, I don't think it, it had any particular stylistic uh, or stylistic uh, explanation. I think he was just uh, a fantastic chess player playing uh, good but worse chess players than he was. Yeah, I was also surprised by the question because at least I was associating him with being a King's Indian yeah, killer. He yeah, yeah. Famous saying he fed his family for beating the King's Indian for years. Yeah, that that, that is a very very famous quote, and uh, that also that is also what comes to mind first to, to my mind. I mean, uh, when you think about a you know a signature opening where he was just uh, extremely dominant over over his opponents, uh, it's not the Grunfeld, it is the King's Indian, but. As I say, as I said, I think, uh, I mean, I have no reason to doubt your statement. If you say that they were exceptional, they probably were exceptional. But I think the explanation was not, uh, was not to do with his playing style. It was simply uh, to do with the fact that he was an exceptionally strong chess player. Right. Oh, I think we have a tough question coming up from Mr. T. Easy. Hi, Peter. What do you think are the key topics that divide the advanced levels of chess players? For example, what can an IM do better than an FM? Or what is the key difference between a 2500, a 2600, a 2700 and your level? Best regards, Damir, who is an FM with 2270. Uh, maybe it's time to include you in the answers. What do you think is the difference between, let's say, a 26 and 2700? Uh, I, I thought about this as well. I think, basically, as people progress, as people uh, learn and continue to play, first of all, the, the, the sum of their knowledge grows. And if you play sort of for long enough and if you, if you get further, uh, you just 
know more than people who are starting. And uh, opening, opening knowledge in particular is, uh, you know, uh, it's a huge part of today's game, maybe in, uh, uh, slightly out of proportion. Just how much uh, your opening knowledge de determines how well you do cur uh, currently, you know, in, in the current uh, climate. But uh, I don't think there is any, you know, class of things that an international master knows and, and a FIDE master doesn't. I think a FIDE master is an international master who hasn't played chess en uh, enough yet. Uh, there could be, I mean, some people do have a ceiling they will never reach above. But it's very, very difficult to determine who, who, who does and who doesn't. And in general, it's, it's a question of experience. And, you know, I could use, uh, you know, psychobabble like, you know, pattern recognition, which also, I think, has a lot to do with experience. Uh, so uh, the more you play, the more you learn to uh, recognize certain things you have seen before and react to them in an optimal way. But once again, I'm not, you know, a deep, uh, deep thinker on uh, questions of chess philosophy. I think it's mainly to do with experience and, uh, you know, your level of commitment to the game. Uh, but I don't think there is, you know, there are classes of, uh, classes of things which uh, top level people know and uh, lower, lower uh, level people don't, apart from openings. Openings definitely uh, is... Uh, uh, one area of the game where uh, the top players have, uh, you know, a, a huge advantage over over people uh, uh, lower down the rank. Yeah, I got nothing clever either. I think it's too individual. Like, you can always go to the pattern recognition. The stronger the player, the more patterns he recognizes more quickly, and the less he has to work out consciously. I think it's very individual. I was always very good at openings. I wasn't very good at being practical, using my time, being a fighter. And I believe everybody has their own story, like yeah, that's that's very so true. But but and also maybe one thing I wanted to point out that uh, perhaps uh, the difference between the really really top players and and level uh, and and players uh, lower down uh, lower down the ladder is uh, the higher you get, uh, the higher you get. Uh, the stronger uh, the position. And if you get really, really high and you stay there, this means uh, that uh, you got there and you didn't get killed. And that means that you adapted and you probably are, a, 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 well, an all-rounder, a more or less complete chess player who has no obvious holes in his game. Because if you, uh, we, all, we all have a level at which we get found out, so to speak. And uh, if, you, if you reach really, really high and you stay there for a while, it means that uh, you weren't really found out, at least not entirely at that level. And that probably means, because you, since you were playing against the best of the best, uh, let's say if your uh, you know, positional understanding or endgame technique is abysmal, well, I, I mean, I use the word abysmal, it's not going to be abysmal, but much, much worse than your position, they will consciously steer you towards those positions and beat you there, and you will disappear from sight, so to speak. And if this hasn't happened, then uh, it probably means that uh, y you've uh, acquired those skills that you m may have initially lacked. And y the people at the top are, you know, they're much more of a complete chess player. Right. Oh, next question <laughs> strikes me as an excellent one. It's by a user called Jan. He says, Dear Peter, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Uh, yeah, uh, I did some research. Yeah, yeah, fantastic question. I did some research on that, uh, and uh, my, you know, I've I've uh, ran into this question before, and I actually gave it some uh, some thought at some point. And uh, my my initial reaction w was always to, to 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 fight a bunch of uh, duck-sized horses because you know it just. It feels ridiculous, you know. They they will be there, you know. Uh, you can you can stomp on them, and uh, it just sounds like uh, uh, that should be uh, an easier fight than a fight. I mean, uh, I've I've met horses up close. They are, uh, you know, impressively dangerous animals, and uh, they're big as well. So but this uh, is a but <laughs> yeah. But as I as I said, I did some I did some research. And apparently, uh, you can imagine a uh, hundred duck-sized horses uh, sort of functioning reasonably well for a while, whereas a horse-sized duck will probably collapse under its own weight, will definitely not fly, and uh, might not 
sort of be, be, be able to survive for very much. So uh, in terms of pure EV, I think it's better to, 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 to fight a one-size one horse, uh, horse size duck. I could not agree more. I'd be scared of like a hundred small horses. They team up against you? No, I, I understand, but still, you know, the the ridiculousness factor I think is uh, higher with a with a hundred of duck sized horses. They just, they, you know, they they see the idea sounds laughable somehow. You know, they're, they're pets, whereas a horse sized duck is a, is a monster. And I, I gravitate towards pets versus monsters when I think about this. But as I said, in terms of you know, if you want to win the fight, I think I think you have to pick the the duck. Yeah. Mm. Excellent answer. Thank you. What we got next? We got Rylinje123. Dear Peter, can you give... Probably advice on how. Hmm. Advice on how to improve his rating and recommendations. What was your way to the Grand Master? How much did you train with whom? What are your experiences in training matters? Mr. Producer, is Rylinje123 a premium member? Just double checking because we are only supposed to answer premium member questions, important part of the show. Let's see if we get a nod. <coughs> no, sorry, Raleigh we have to move to the next question there. Um, I'm sure we'll come up with a similar question to this one, though. The, the, However, the, there will we be, to yeah. This one for the premium guys. Sliva is asking, Dear Peter, which is, in your opinion, the essential chess book and TV series? Uh, okay, I should probably address the book question first because the TV series might take a while. Uh, I don't think you can name one essential chess book. For me, uh, you know, the first book I uh, read sort of from cover to cover and actually destroyed in the process of rereading. I, I read it so much over and over again that it fell apart in my hands when I was about seven or eight. Uh, my dad's uh, colleague at work had uh, a copy of uh, How to Beat Bobby Fischer by Edmund Mednes, uh, which uh, was an extremely rare uh, book in the uh, Soviet times, and uh, he loaned it to us, and uh, it was actually rather rather awkward because we couldn't return it. It was in such condition that we actually uh, had to compensate him somehow and keep the book. It's not an essential book, but I loved it, you know, with all my heart. I, I read it over and over again, and it must have influenced me in a huge way, at least in terms of, you know, uh, you know, falling in love with chess content. Uh, it's not the most impressive book in the world, but uh, that's the first one I absolutely devoured, uh, including literally. <laughs> uh, there are, you know, all the obvious candidates. Uh, although I think modern thinking is that uh, my system may not be such a great book. I was brought up on, you know, you were given uh, my system at some point and told to read it and sort of report when you read it, and uh, that was that was the way the uh, the Soviet kids were taught. Uh, the current thinking, I, I think, I suspect from what I hear, is that uh, my system is now obsolete and you don't really need it. I'm not a big fan of the book, but I read it at a later age. It always yeah, surprises me greatly when people say my system was the one book that really influenced them. I, I can't say, uh, you know, the, the concepts or, or in that book uh, made, you know, a, a profound difference to my life more than any other book. But I did, I did read it and I found it uh, interesting and well-written and definitely useful. But as I, as I said, uh, I suspect it's uh, somewhat out of out of fashion now, and uh, there is a lot of very good tournament books. But uh, naming one essential book is, I think, almost impossible. Uh, in general, I think if you're just beginning uh, uh, to, to to learn chess, read as much as possible. I, I know it kind of clashes with what I said about uh, not reading for the past 10, 15 years. But when I was a kid, uh, my parents uh, at some point uh, uh, bought me uh, about two and a half full libraries of chess books people were selling at that time. So basically I had, I had a huge choice of books and I, I think I read, if I say upwards of 90% of what, what was uh, on the shelves, I think it will be uh, an, honest, an honest assessment. And uh, I think it's hugely beneficial to uh, avail you, you know, yourself of uh, any chess knowledge that is, is, is out there. And then I think your brain will filter out what you don't need and uh, you will uh, assimilate stuff that you do need. So uh, do read. I, I highly recommend it. 
So now let's get to the part of what happened after you after you read all these chess books, the TV series. Yeah, that's the that, essential TV series. I think that, that m there could be a correlation there actually, because the, the moment I seriously got into watching TV series, I, I may have uh, sort of started slacking off on the on the chess book reading. But essential TV series, no, uh, so do, do we want to get involved with this? <clears throat> this is a yeah, this is a ninety. It's not like we like it, but we have to answer every question. <laughs> this is right? a this is a supposedly a ninety-minute show, and uh, answering this question can take uh, pretty much any time available. To, to no, let's shorten it. The correct answer is the wire, as everybody knows. Yeah, but the, you don't want to give the you know the correct answer. It's uh, it just feels wrong to just you know uh, blithely assume that you know it's the wire and let's move on. It's it's. Uh, it is. It absolutely has to be watched, but I don't think uh, the question was the the essential TV series, right? Yeah, if if you have to go with one, I think it's still The Wire. Although I mean, we we are now uh, basically uh, we are confirming every uh, you know racial stereotype out there, right? We, we are you know two two white guys saying The Wire is the best thing ever. This is, I think. This is what we're supposed to say, and this is what we're saying. It still is the best well, thing that's ever. Because it's the best thing ever. Yeah, I understand. But uh, on the other hand, you know, if we said anything else, I think there would be shock and outcry. As long as you don't say Breaking Bad, I respect Breaking Bad. It's beautifully done, and it's Disagree. very clever, yeah. and thought of every detail. But it does not compare to The Wire, and all these people saying Breaking Bad is. Best yeah, that's that's really what that's what he me. keeps on keeps on saying, and I sit next to him and nod and and, and think you philistine, you have no idea. But uh, let's move on. Anyway, it's your Q and A. You yeah, very wrong. Um, let's I'm not. I'm not very wrong. I was trying to think of a sort of a larger answer because you know the moment you just nod your nod your head and say yeah, the why move on. I mean, you, you, it's lazy answering. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Then let's stop the lazy stuff and get into the next question by Beta Blinks. There was an opening repertoire book written by G. M. Khalifman in 2001 called Opening for Black According to Karpov. The basis of the repertoire was to play the Nimzo Queen's Indian complexes against 1d4 and the Karl Khan against 1e4. My question is, do you think it's possible for someone to play these openings for the rest of their chess career and achieve success? Is there a limit to what level someone could reach by playing only these openings? By successful, I mean achieving master titles up to GM, then further rating achievements up to SGM, Super GM, I guess. Probably, yeah. And even World Champion. Thank you if you're able to answer. I'm a big fan of your commentary and chess abilities. I hope you get your opportunity to fight in a World Championship match someday. Yeah, chess, ab chess. chess abilities, I like that. Uh, like special it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, moving on. I think uh, the the 1d4 part is definitely very very uh, valid, and I think there is absolutely uh, uh, no problem with with only playing the uh, the Nimzo Queen's Indian uh, against 1d4. Those openings are extremely sound and very solid, and uh, you know as uh, there are openings out there which could be said to be even more risk free, but this is. You know, as sound uh, positionally as you can hope for for uh, in a repertoire against 1d4, and uh, you know, I'm saying this as a lifelong Grunfeld player. Uh, I still love the Grunfeld, but uh, Grunfeld presents uh, all kinds of different challenges, and uh, it's definitely riskier positionally than than the Nimzo Queen's Indian uh, complex, as it was referred to there. As for Caro uh, playing exclusively the Caro. Uh, will probably uh, get you into trouble at some point. I'm not saying uh, it's a refutable opening. I think uh, these days if you play anything well enough you can survive. But the Kara will present you with uh, very, very serious challenges and you will have to sort of constantly constantly keep, uh, keep uh, ahead of uh, you know, recent developments. It's a solid opening, it's fine, but I think against 1e4 if you want to play one opening for the rest of your life, it, it probably has to be either either the, the, the Spanish or the, the Rue Lopez or, or some kind of a Sicilian. But uh, once again, uh, 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 you know, if you're playing the Nimza with uh, against 1d4, it's probably, it's probably the Rue Lopez against 1e4 in, in terms of 
uh, the, the soundness and and safety and and general uh, general you know uh, approach to uh, to openings. But since this was a book about uh, you know uh, the title kind of gives you gives you a hint there. Uh, Karpov's signature opening against Twenty Four is the Karakhan. At least it has been uh, you know in the later stages of his career. So. Uh, the, the argument had to be made for, for that book to, 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 to show a repertoire like this. I can recall quite a few E4, E5 games by Karpov too. Defin definitely, but I think uh, at some point, uh, well, at the very late, late stages of his career, he went back to uh, both the Petrov and, uh, and, and some of the, uh, the Spanish. But there was a period when he was playing exclusively, the, pretty much exclusively the Karakhan against all comers and doing very, very well. And you know some of the ideas in the car, for instance, you know the signature uh, position where Black just uh, gets checked along the, the A4 E8 diagonal and just plays King E7. Uh, it's it's more or less called the Carp of King now. Uh, his contribution to the opening cannot be uh, overstated. But uh, I think uh, if you want to build a lifelong repertoire. Uh, it's not impossible to play the car for your entire life, but I think you're challenging yourself unduly. I think there are easier lives out there. And don't you super strong players believe that White is just better after 3 e5 because he has more space? It's a simplistic approach. The problem with this, this is what I've been playing for the past, let's say, 15 years. I've stopped more or less completely uh, allowing g takes e4 and move 3, and uh, I've had some success after 3 e5 in general. but. Uh, uh, the problem is, you know, in, uh, as with everything else in, in, in current chess, is that uh, uh, people start looking for forced draws. It no longer is a game of concepts. Conceptually, I think uh, e4, c6, d4, d5, e5 has to be better for white. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to, uh, to play a conceptual uh, opening game these days against somebody who is prepared to meet you head on and look for forced draws. Uh, and then the question becomes, is there a force draw there? I, I think the jury is still out. There's, there was a very important game in St. Louis where um, uh, Maxim Vashielagraf played a line which was supposed to give Black perhaps the best, the, the best chance of a force draw against 3-5 and ran into some monster preparation and lost. Whether there is a draw, if he, uh, uh, had he found best play for Black, whether this is still a draw or not, I can't really say. But Basically, it becomes an arms race, uh, as with everything else. Fair enough. <coughs> Let's move on. Ted Lawyer has another question. Okay, we'll give you another one. Hello, Peter. I have one last question that I forgot to ask before. How does your preparation for a chess tournament differ now than when you were an international master or initially a grandmaster? Well, not greatly, unless uh, it's something like the candidates when I... Uh, uh, have uh, you know motivation enough and uh, resources enough because I do have to uh, say that uh, without uh, help from the Russian Chess Federation, it would have been hard to to do what I did for the past two candidates. But uh, uh, when I'm on my own, my preparation uh, regimen has not really differed greatly uh, for for the past uh, twenty years or so. Uh, that is to say, I don't really prepare that much before the tournament. I do quite a lot of work during the tournament, preparing for each game, but not before the tournament. Uh, but for the big events in the past couple of years, I've been able to uh, uh, basically hire people to, uh, to work on chess, uh, chess together. And this, of course, makes a huge, huge difference because in, both in London and in Hante, I felt like I had no serious opening problems to speak of. Uh, which is a very, very novel feeling for me, to be honest, and uh, it, it, it allows me to play with, you know, a degree of freedom which I don't normally feel. Mm -hmm. Moving on, which one we got? Kappa1913? <laughs> He's asking, Dear Peter, thanks for your amazing presentation about the Grunfeld. Thank you. Are there structures on the Grunfeld where the engines have difficulties in evaluating the positions? If so, could you give an example? And finally, do you plan to publish a Black Repertoire video series after 1E4? Many thanks. Well, uh, there will be some videos uh, to do with uh, 1E4. I'm right now in Jib, uh, having finished uh, work on you know the, the my sort of opening salvo in my 
in my one four videos. I'm hoping that they will be released uh, at some I point. Those were for white. Yes, th th those those were not black repertoire videos. But uh, as with all these things, uh, you know, it's 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 called a re white repertoire. But uh, I think it's a reasonably safe bet that uh, black players can find something in there which will be useful to them as well. So, you know, they're not prohibited from watching this and learning something, hopefully. Uh, as for uh, positions where engines uh, don't really understand uh, the evaluation precisely, I think in the Grunfeld, the one that comes to mind, and once again, I may be wrong about this, but I will, I will keep this answer because it's the only one that came to my mind immediately after I've seen the question. Uh, there is this structure where, let's say, in the classical, in the bishop c4 lines, where black plays both, both c5 and d5, and white gets a passer on d5. And it's not immediately challenged. Uh, but uh, let's say black is in time to switch his knight via, let's say, a5, b7 to d6. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, if black is not by this point getting mated on the king side, he should be doing quite well. But I think uh, the machine still tends to uh, over-evaluate the, the, the spatial advantage in, in, in these structures. But uh, I think uh, those uh, leaks are very far and few between this, these times. They're pretty good, these computers yeah. nowadays, right? Yeah, I think, I think they, they not, not only mate you very efficiently, but they also are uh, much, much better compared to, uh, you know, previous years in, in correctly understanding what to aim for. And uh, uh, they, are, they are pretty decent, I have to say. By the way, I just saw one question I think we passed up there on my screen with someone asking about the PGN files, Ginger Tail, <coughs> that are accompanying the Grunfeld series. We can't blame Peter for this, and we're sorry they're not on the website yet. We're really working on putting something nice together when it comes to ebooks to present the analysis, which many people have been asking for, and rightly so as well. We're hoping they will be there shortly, not just for Peter's series, but also for the rest. Sorry, you have to stay patient for a little while, but we are I, working on yeah, it. Yeah, I, un I understand it's a concern, and I would also like to, to, to apologize, because I keep on referring to them in the videos, and I, I understand it must be slightly annoying to, to know that there is something out there which could help in understanding the material, and it's not yet available. But uh, it will, I'm sure, at some we'll point, it, it will become available, and uh, please, please stay patient. Moving on, TM Schaken, is that a premium member? I'm sorry, sometimes I have to double check. He is. <clears throat> do you take the time to analyze all your own games thoroughly and in general? Do you think this is a good way to work on your chess? Who does that? I used to do that, uh, but I, I no longer do. And uh, I think to a degree uh, you should, uh, well, not you, uh, uh, TM, but uh, I mean, y y one reason for that is that you come back home for, 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 from uh, the board, you switch the machine on, you go to chess bomb, and uh, you see all those red moves. He means you go to chess 24 and you check the engine evaluations. <laughs> or that as well, yeah. But uh, I, I meant pr the, the, color, the color code is, is really uh, what uh, drove me away from this idea, is that you think you played a good game, and and then your entire game is red, and it it just feels like you were shamed into something. You know, it feels like uh, uh, it. When I was growing up, analyzing your own game uh, was something you did. Uh, well, at least I did. Sort of, uh, it was a huge, huge uh, part of your uh, development, and uh, and but that. But it was manual work. You did it yourself, and you improved that way because you were forced to analyze, you were forced to figure out what you did wrong in the opening. This way you developed your opening understanding. It was a huge part, it was a huge part of your game, of course. But uh, these days, there are answers readily, readily available online the moment you, you get back uh, to, to your room for, from the game. And that kind of discourages you, because not only are they readily available, they are generally very unflattering. Uh, <coughs> so uh, you look at your games if, let's say, if you played something which is important to you theoretically in the opening and it got refuted. 
or you feel it, it might have uh, gotten refuted and you need to check whether you can still play the line. But in general, I, I, I do this less than, than I did uh, when, uh, when I was a kid. Evil computers out there, they're making us lazy. At least um, for me, because it's so, so hard to motivate to look at something without an engine which gives you these yeah, instant answers. Yeah, that, that is, that is uh, a problem because uh, you still need to, uh, I mean, uh, analyzing something live and trying to r really uh, understand something about the position. Yes, it will be slower than you just uh, than if uh, than uh, com compared to when you're using a, an electronic helper. But it's still uh, it's still very important to do that at least every now and then. But it's uh, it's hard work convincing yourself you have to. Mm -hmm. Let's see what Osai Distilo is asking. He's saying if you're a super GM, calculate superbly strategic monster. What is it that Magnus? Also applies to those you believe are much better than you has, but you lack. What is it there on the twenty eight hundred level? I think mainly it's uh, two things. Uh, I did think about it because uh, we had some time to uh, to have. I looked at this. I looked at this question before, and I, I and I spent some time thinking about it. And I think the question is. A youth, in my case, which is something they have and I no longer do. But mainly, I think it's consistency. I can still play uh, a game of chess every now and then that I'm uh, very happy showing to anybody, and the, you know that I think will you know stand the test uh, re regardless of what you compare it to. But these days, I play more and more uh, games which are not really all that good, maybe not that bad, but not all that good. Whereas uh, Magnus uh, does not really play, well, that's not entirely true. I mean, in the, pa in the past, let's say, half a year, he has played some games which were unchar uncharacteristically, uh, well, not to his normal standard, let's put it like this. But generally speaking, he is incredibly consistent. He uh, does not really make huge mistakes at all. And this is what separates uh, him and uh, others who uh, aspire to that level, let's say. Uh, what was perhaps the most striking about Fabiano's performance in San Luis was not, mistakes. Yeah, was not the result itself, which was, uh, I mean, unbelievable, no words, uh, use your own adjectives. But the fact that he was winning all those games, uh, committing perhaps minor errors when the game was already settled. Basically, uh, the machine says uh, you can win in five moves here, and he would win in seven or ten. Uh, and that was what was really, uh, to me, uh, to, to my eyes, what was the most striking thing about his performance. It was the, the, the absolutely unbelievable level of consistency, game after game, move after move. Uh, he did get tired towards the end of it. He is uh, still human. but. Uh, for 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 you know vast majority of the event he was playing uh, there are no words and and this i think is what what separates uh the very very top from uh let's say so starting with somebody like me since you know it's my journey <coughs> mr slavov is asking oof that's a long question hello peter my question when one looks on giants like Fisher, Karpov, Kasparov, or nowadays Carlson, it looks like these guys had only one priority in life, chess. Chess was for them on first, second, third place in their lives, and just then there was something else. When one looks on you, or at kayaking, Grishuk, etc., it's clear that you have also other important priorities, as important as chess, like family. And many say that this is a reason why guys like Fischer, Karpov, Kasparov were famous world champions. And you are only a super jam top 10 player, although your talent in IMHO comparable to theirs. Is your opinion, in your opinion, is that observation correct? Is it true that one has to put chess on first place in his life and sacrifice everything else to be a great world champion? Thanks, Slavov. Not sure if Slavov might have offended some people with that. Question. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, I, I think he, 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 he means well. But what I would like to say is I would very much like to agree with that sentiment because it uh, implies that, uh, you know, I am not uh, a, a five-time world champion and the all-time all great because I, you know, chose something else in life. But I think... Let's blame your kids. Yeah, 
that's that's the that's the way to go, obviously. But I think uh, I mean there is some truth to that, but it's a simplistic explanation, which uh, I mean it's 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 a very convenient one for me, and uh, I may have even used it in some interviews, and if I did, I should probably feel slightly ashamed. Uh, Dedication is uh, is absolutely necessary, but dedication to the extent of exclusion of everything else, maybe yes, maybe no. I'm not entirely sure, and and definitely uh, thanks thanks for the compliment, but I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I think uh, you know people who emerge as as all time greats, uh, they are there for a reason, and people who don't. They are not there for a reason, and the reason is not just, uh, you know, the, the fullness of uh, of your life outside chess. Fair enough. <coughs> I know this Carlson guy. He does a lot of crap. He's, he's not that dedicated to chess, is he? Yeah. I'm, I'm, once again, you know, I, I don't really want this to, to you know. Yeah. Let's not make, make it personal. I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah, like, not everybody. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think that the theory holds up even if you take, let's say, those four names and, and start actually taking apart uh, their lives. I mean, uh, as I said, it's a it's a simplistic. It's a generalization, which, as all generalizations go, I mean, it's it's true to a degree. But uh, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really explain you know the, the, the entire world. The problem is putting in the hours is probably needed at any level, right? But yeah, it's, it's not everything. No, I, I'm fairly sure that let's say uh, my uh, my results or you know lack thereof, you know, in as much as you can say that I I did not achieve something in my career. Uh, had a lot to do uh, with not working enough, but that should not be explained by me living a full life and having family and and, and I think it's just you know uh, the way I'm built, regrettably, and uh, you know without without family and kids, I would have found something else uh, which would have you know distracted me from working as much as I should have worked when I was younger. This is getting too serious. Let's move on to some lighter questions. Slavov has another one, but I think we covered this one more or less already, right? Is there something you like to achieve in chess in future? I quite like them candidate tournaments. I would like to play another one of those and maybe win one, and then I would get to play a world championship match. That actually is a legitimate goal I have. It's uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the, the number of shots I will get at this uh, is probably not increasing, but uh, that is a legitimate goal. Oh, this next question I'm only willing to even read out because I'm already afraid of the answer. After I get confirmation, this guy is like super premium. Ah, yes. N-D-R-W-W-L-L-T-T-S is saying he likes cricket. Ask him. <laughs> you like cricket. I will ask you, are you pleased that Yorkshire won the championship today for the first time since 2001? If you say no, then why do you have no taste? I... I have to say that I'm not a Yorkshire supporter as such, but they played a fantastic season and they're the deserved winners. And I think it's a travesty that Andrew Gale was not allowed to hold the trophy. And uh, let's leave it at that before Jan gets too, too upset about this line of questioning. No, I mean, if this was basketball, I, I would keep you going for hours. But cricket, no, I shouldn't say anything wrong. I'm already at war with David Smurn. Um, we got a question by Paul Cooksey33. Is he premium? Uh, I have to run all these tracks. I'm sorry, I can't see it here. And I think you, it's up to you if you want to comment on it. He's asking, what do you think Russia has to do differently to win the Olympiad? That one is very, very easy, and I will tackle it happily. Win more matches. Sounds decent. And number two. Uh, and that one I probably should touch because uh, uh, it's noticeable that uh, Vladimir has not played in as well as he normally plays in his recent mm -hmm. tournaments. But uh, even you know, trying to answer why uh, would be ridiculous from from my viewpoint. I don't know, and I wouldn't want to speculate. And uh, you know, he is he is a great player, and. Uh, I, I will not try to, to get into his head and try to, to determine what, what's going on with him. 
We're still working on that Kramnik Q&A. We need a bit of patience. Yoga Nidra is asking, do you have any advice for an 1800 player to reach the 2000 level? Is solving a lot of tactical puzzles an effective way? Um, there probably will be more questions uh, um, like that uh, further further up the uh, the screen. And I just I want to preface anything I say on the subject by, and I don't want to sound uh, you know in any way dismissive, but I don't really remember. It's been a while, and uh, it's very very hard for me to. Uh, uh, effectively, uh, you know, imagine uh, what it is like uh, to get from 1800 to 2000 level. Uh, so what I will be saying is, is, you know, very, very general advice, which is, I think, applicable to, to chess progress in general. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry if this is sort of not specific enough to your situation, but uh, once again, it, it has been a while. I think uh, solving tactical puzzles is a decent, is a decent thing uh, to do, but it shouldn't be the only thing you do. And uh, if I'm, uh, you know, if I were talking, uh, if I were giving advice to a, a young person who is beginning to play chess, I, I would give him the advice, or her, uh, the advice that was given to me when I was uh, growing up, which was uh, play as much as you like, uh, as, 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 as you can, not, 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 not as much as you like, play really play all the chess you can get your hands on, play uh, tournaments, play blitz, uh, sort of submerge yourself uh, in chess as much as possible because uh, when you're just learning the game, nothing teaches you faster than practice. Try playing against people who are slightly better than you, obviously. Not a lot better, but slightly better than you. People who will beat you occasionally, people who will teach you things, people who will show you things you haven't seen before. But uh, practice above all at this level I think should be uh, should be helpful. Another question by Paul Cooksey 33 Peter hopefully a friendlier question he's just upgraded to premium which videos should he watch first? He says his tactics are far too bad to consider playing the Grunfeld. I'm not sure then I mean uh, if you're not watching my videos, you're not watching the... Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, come on, I, I should show some pride in my work. But uh, once again, uh, if, if Greenfield is not up to your taste, try, try to find some content, content which you feel re relates more to your current situation. But uh, learning is good. Uh, mm -hmm. Find something to watch and watch it. Read books. You know, if you ask me, those videos are good and you should watch them even, even if you don't play the Grunfeld, they're fun and, you know, there are interesting positions to, uh, to, to observe, but uh, if you What you really want to watch is my series on how to build a 1D4 repertoire. There's no tactics, it's all very dull and abstract. You see, I, I was, I was uh, planning to pass this on and then I forgot. Now, anyway, we do have a lot of good content, hopefully, for all levels. And I also think you don't need to be a genius tactician to play the Grunfeld, right? It is strategic. There is a lot of strategy going on, but you, you, I mean, it's a, in its foundations, it's a, let's say it's a more tactical opening than the Nimza, for instance. Concrete, yeah, it's, yeah. You, you, do, you do at some point need to play very concretely in a lot of lines to survive. So in, in that respect, I think Paul is correct. But uh, still, I, at least, some of those videos I'm very, very proud of. I mean, some of, some of them are proper masterpieces, in my opinion. I haven't seen any of those. I'll have a look. No, of course I have. Slavov, third question. I'm not sure people are allowed three questions. Let's see if it's a good question. I'd like to hear your opinion on French defense. In your opinion, we've briefly touched this before. Why do the majority of GM and almost all Super GM choose to play 1e5 or 1c5 as answer to 1e4? Uh, I think the answer is twofold. First of all, both uh, the, the Spanish and the Sicilian offer you a much broader scope uh, to choose from. Uh, both of those openings, I mean, if you play 1e5, you're not really, really limited to, uh, you know, one structure even, uh, let alone one line. Uh, that is not to say that uh, the French is necessarily one structure or one line, but it does limit Black's opportunities uh, uh, more than uh, the Spanish or the Sicilian. 
But the bigger, I think the bigger issue with the French uh, is, at least for me, let's say, it was always a very, very difficult uh, opening to understand. Uh, I did not do that badly in terms of practical results, but actually understanding what's going on in this opening, even from the white side, and you know, it's generally accepted that the white side is the more comfortable side of the French defense. Uh, but still, uh, uh, and this brings me, brings me to my second point. This was mainly to do with the fact that uh, I played the French almost exclusively against uh, Alexander Morozevich, who uh, put in a tremendous he was white, right? He yeah, yeah. Uh, he put in a tremendous amount of work and uh, uh, imagination into building his French repertoire. And if you do that, it becomes a very, very attractive uh, uh, option against 1e4 because uh, people don't, don't encounter it all that often these days. And people are no longer very convinced with their choices. And I think uh, it's very, very playable. And it also is a very sharp opening, which gives you, uh, you could argue that it definitely gives you more uh, you know, counter chances than the Spanish. If uh, the white player would prefer a quiet life, he will find it harder to to find a quiet life in the French than in the Spanish. But it does require. Just to clarify, we say the Spanish. You mean e4, e5, right? Yeah. Because the Italian, for example, strikes me as even duller. Than yeah. The Spanish, the, 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 precisely, and also, I mean, one, one e5 does give white a number of options where you know playing for a win with black. It's not impossible, but it's uh, you know. Uh, there are problems. Uh, and the French is an incredibly fighting opening and a very exciting opening and uh, it's very, very playable. But the amount of work required to make it work I think is uh, much, much larger than uh, it is uh, in particular in the Spanish. And you know, people who are prepared to uh, do the hard yards and, and work on this opening, I think find it very, very uh, rewarding. And uh, uh, Marazevich's results were fantastic in, in the French. And he kept on getting very, very good positions and positions which suited him pers personally very, very well. But uh, once again, uh, one th and this is a bit of a, a tangent, but uh, what people, I think, often misunderstand about Marazevich is that uh, apart from uh, his uh, obvious tactical genius and you know the originality he showed in almost all of his games, I think people uh, often misunderstand have this misapprehension that this was all, you know, impromptu. Inspiration. Yeah, inspiration over the board. The amount of work uh, he invested into his offbeat openings is uh, absolutely stunning. That is not to take anything away from his playing style, which uh, made him, uh, you know, one of the most watchable chess players in the history of chess, and he still is uh, when he's on good form. But people somehow tend to assume that this this was all entirely over the board inspiration. It wasn't. Hmm. Let's see what Super Oman has to say. Good evening, Peter. What is your advice for a player who left the competition for one year and wants to come back to play in an open tournament? What should he focus on? Openings, calculation or online blitz to get some practice? He's waiting for your next video series, which will be out shortly. Best wishes from Oman. Well, uh, I addressed it to, to a degree. I think uh, Depending on your level, openings becomes you know more of a factor or less of a factor. And uh, I wouldn't want to speculate. I really have uh, no idea what uh, what level of play we're talking about here. But uh, I would start by suggesting that you you, you play uh, as much as possible. And uh, I do have to say that uh, if your if your aim is to improve your classical game, then uh, online blitz might be. Uh, it does give you practice. It allows you to perhaps uh, you know try it, try out some new openings which uh, people have been doing for uh, for ages online. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, it also it also has the potential of bringing some bad habit, habits which uh, are not perhaps necessary in the classical ch in the classical chess. But on the other hand, you know uh, online blitz uh, has been and still is you know the easiest way to find practice games. It's not, it's not that easy to find uh, you know, live chess uh, readily available. 
so uh, if, if there's nothing else, sure play play uh, online, but generally try to find try to find some tournaments to play in. Mm. Just click on play in the upper right corner on chess 24. Plenty of guys, plenty of time controls. Sorry, I have to throw some plugs in there once in a while. And the RWWLLTTS is asking another excellent question. He's not asking an excellent question. What's going on? Ah, sorry. Moving on. I'm getting some signs here. Matt Chess is asking, thanks for taking our questions. <clears throat> what do you think are the top three mistakes or misconceptions that stand in the way of club players around 1700 improving and what would your advice be for club players to ad address these top three issues? Do you I know any 1700 guys, by the way? <clears throat> uh, no disrespect meant at all. Just people assume you know their problems better than I think you do sometimes, right? I was about to say that, and I was uh, suggesting maybe we brainstorm this for a bit because I would like to address it. But I'm, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, I, I, I touched on this earlier, and uh, it's, it's really hard for me uh, to even. Uh, when I was growing up, there were no ratings at those levels. I mean, there were uh, grades. And I don't really know what grade corresponds to 1700 even. So it's, it's very hard for me to, to, to address this in any way that will make sense. What are the uh, amateur misconceptions people start with? Uh, you know, one thing I'm tempted to say is that basically uh, you get taught some basics. And then as you progress in chess, you realize that those are not rules, they are guidelines. And there are exceptions to them and you uh, don't necessarily want to you know, religiously stick to them in, in every single game. But I think 1700 is a bit too early for that lesson, to be honest. Yeah, I was gonna say that <clears throat> at 1700. I believe one big mistake people make is, it's a bit twofold, that first of all, I think they spend almost all their time on openings, which you don't have to do at that level because it's not that, that important. That definitely is true. And then not only do they spend, or at least this is the people I know, it doesn't apply for everybody, do they spend their time on openings? They're also very afraid that their opponents know the openings better, so they spend their time on bad openings because they're afraid of rival preparation instead that, of learning something decent. That, that is actually, uh, I think, a, a very, very nice point. And uh, yeah, uh, one of my, uh, I wouldn't say it impacted my, you know, chess career hugely, but as I already mentioned in the show, for, for, the, first, uh, for the first, I don't know, uh, five, uh, six, uh, maybe even seven years of, of my chess development, I played uh, mainly, uh, What's the uh, PC term I want to use here? Non-challenging openings with white. Mm. Uh, and then I had to sort of uh, completely, uh, you know, reschool myself and switch to 1e4 and switch, uh, you know, gradually. I started by stopping with the with the cole and the you know queen pawn opening and uh, switching to 1e4. And I started by playing the gioco piano because it you know challenged me less and I didn't really know need to know that much theory. And I progressed to the uh, to the Spanish, and uh, but you will be better off if you don't have to go through this process. Yeah. If you start by playing uh, sound opening, not only will you run into uh, you know less trouble uh, f from a practical standpoint, it will also teach you much sounder values, uh, which uh, will will stand you in good stead uh, for for the remainder of your career. Couldn't agree more. For me. I spent so much time playing e4, g6 every game and playing d4, knight of 3, bishop g5 every game, even as a reasonably decent player, as like a 2350, 2400 player, and I should really have used that time. No, I actually, I, I actually came to perk as a more or less uh, f fully formed chess player as a, as a way of broadening my, broadening my repertoire and sort of including something which was sharper and somewhat more offbeat. But I did start by playing the Spanish with black, and, and I think this was a, you know, hugely beneficial for me as a chess player. With black, my repertoire wasn't that bad. With white, I was playing a lot of ridiculous stuff. Yeah, no, it's nothing against these particular openings, but I just lost a lot of time because I didn't broaden my horizon. If every game you go g6, bishop g7, no, c6, d5, you don't learn that much. As, as, as I said, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine to include them at some point, but uh, I think a better starting point would be a kind of a 
classical repertoire. Not necessarily, you know, boring stuff. If you don't want to play E45, play E4, C5. Just don't, don't play the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, modern immediately. You need some kind of a, you know, classical, classical education, uh, an understanding of complex structures before you switch to, to those openings, which I think, uh, basically playing those openings is a little bit like, you know, trying to run before you can walk. The funny thing is it's also very often the same opening, so then it happens that guys are actually better prepared for this at 1700 that, level. That is also people play 2C3 in the Sicilian because they say, yeah, my opponents know so much about the main lines, so I see a lot more C3 in. Yeah, that, that is also true. So uh, we started off by saying don't focus on openings so much and then spend the entire answer <laughs> talking about openings, which I think may, may have been a logical logical fallacy somewhere. No, also at that level the most important thing, and it's kind of true at every level, is not to blunder your pieces and to... Yeah, but that's, but that's not a misconception. I don't think anybody starts off by thinking, yeah, if I blunder a lot of my pieces today I will do well. No, but I'm saying that it makes more sense, in my opinion, to yeah, do tactics training or just play games and think yeah. about them to sharpen those skills. Than that, that, that I think, is definitely the most important skill at, uh, let's call it, amateur level. I, I mean, uh, once again, no disrespect, but uh, uh, not losing on the spot kind of outweighs, uh, you, you know, positional considerations to a degree, I think it to does. a large degree. All right. Matchas, what are your thoughts on the World Championship cycle, schedule and format? How frequently do you think candidates tournaments and championship matches should occur? Are candidates tournaments the best approach to qualify? Mm, I don't really have any kind of a set opinion on the schedule and the cycle. I don't th well, let's put it like this. Three years was too long. When I was, uh, you know, when I was growing up, the books I, 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 I read and the cycle at the time was the three-year cycle. I mean, it, it wasn't adhered to all that much because of all the uh, rematches between Karpov and Kasparov, but uh, the, the structure in place was for a three-year cycle. And three years is way too long. And a lot of people actually fell by the wayside because their peak years fell in this dead period between, uh, between you know, qualification chances. Uh, whether it should be every year uh, is questionable. So it should be either one year or two years and I, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Uh, as for the candidates being the best, the best chance to qualify, well, for somebody who isn't 20, 28.35 or 28.75, as the case may be, uh, probably they are. Although uh, you're doing well in the Grand Prix, uh, I haven't been able to do that, but I think it's not impossible. So uh, one of the two. All right. Wayne Thompson is wondering, hello, Peter, when will you visit the U.S.? Perhaps the Millionaire Chess Challenge would be great to watch your life. Any plans? Uh, not for the Millionaire Chess for um, a number of reasons. Uh, the, the most uh, pertinent of those probably schedule. I simply uh, can't. In the, I mean, I have, I have other commitments in, the, in that time frame. But... Uh, I haven't been to the U.S. in a while, and I'm, uh, I, you know, saying I'm actively looking for uh, uh, things that could sort of bring me there is perhaps an overstatement. But uh, I am; it's one of the uh, ideas for the future. Hmm. I like the U.S. I also haven't been for a while. Gotta go to New York at some point. Sorry, I'm only talking to myself. We're probably still on the air. Peter St is saying, "Hi, Peter. What great next video series can we expect from you?" Well, time for a little plug, I guess. Yeah, I'm. Uh, sure. I've just started what. Uh, let's say the hope is that this will eventually be a really, really large-scale project uh, dealing with uh, uh, the Spanish. Uh, Probably it will, you know, if it, if it works according to plan, it will not be limited to just the white repertoires or the black repertoires. It will be, it will be done as a combination of white repertoires and black repertoires because this, this is what this opening has been to me over the years. I played it with both colors. And uh, I think it makes sense for me to approach the, the, the videos uh, in the same spirit. But... Uh, uh, apart from that, I'm, I'm, I might be uh, doing something else in between the, uh, the videos on the Rui Lopez, but uh, that's the uh, 
the, the big, the, the sort of the major new project uh, I've just started working on. Yeah, and to give you guys something quickly, we I believe we will release as soon as it's post-produced the first part, which we can say right. It's on the yeah, so, yeah. castle's bishop e7, six d3 line, which is extremely topical at the highest level at the moment, and I'm certainly looking forward to it because no one's really explained it all that well so far, and all these I'm, top guys yeah, I'm to not, know something. I'm not. I'm not sure. I I managed to be you know as as clear cut as I set out to be because uh, I I found it. Uh, uh, much more pleasant, uh, I can say this for sure, it's much more pleasant to record training videos from the Black's perspective because if a line ends in a draw, you feel you've done something right. And if a line then ends in a draw and you're giving it from the white perspective, you feel like you've done something wrong and you've kind of cheated your viewers out of uh, some value. Whereas, uh, unfortunately, uh, especially, uh, you know, where sound positionally sound openings like the Spanish are, are concerned, most lines will end in the draw. And uh, this has been a slightly dispiriting experience recording those videos because uh, uh, I tried giving what I honestly think are the best choices for white and yet in many lines uh, all you can hope for is a playable position with no actual advantage. But I did try. I did try my best to uh, uh, to give an overview of uh, 6d3 from uh, from White's perspective, and uh, I hope it will be uh, uh, enjoyable and perhaps even helpful. Of course, he's lying. White is winning in every line. Just check the video series; it will solve all your problems. Moving on to Blumentopf. <clears throat> Hi, Peter. Looking back to your career, do you think you could have achieved more if you would have been more ambitious sometimes? Uh, yes. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Part number two. What do you What do you think about the next season of Homeland without Brody? Oh, that's a spoiler, Blumentopf. I'm only in season two. Anyway, Brody's gone. Seriously? Yeah. You okay? Uh, I'm not saying anything. I had a job. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, nah, I I I I, re I, re I regret that. Uh, or I commiserate is what I wanted to say. Uh. I'm looking forward to it. I think it, it might be good. I mean, Claire Danes is fantastic. Brody's gone. Claire Danes is so terribly annoying. Brody was the only reason, not Claire Danes, the person, the character Claire Danes plays in Homeland. It's an excellent show, but it's, ugh. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, I think we've established that we have uh, uh, slightly differing tastes, but. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, hmm. I'm not sure if this will work. I mean, uh, they might be overstaying their welcome a little bit there, but uh, it seems to me that the team behind Homeland uh, has a fairly decent idea of, uh, y y you know, how long can you take, uh, how, how far can you take a plot line without, uh, you know, giving up on it. And uh, I expect good things. I may be disappointed. You know, wasn't Homeland based on the premise, is Brody a traitor or not? I thought that was what the show was about. And now it will possibly, and I don't want to spoil anything for you, it will possibly be based about, uh, around something else. Hmm. Okay. Ugh, another <laughs> guy who typed a long question. This guy might look familiar to you. Character called KTU. Hi, Peter. I'm a big fan. Great to have you on this awesome page. Some probably stupid questions. Let's, let's pick up. Ugh. Too many. Just pick some of them if you think. There okay, are some handic of them handicap and chess. Uh, uh, I've had some experience with this because uh, when I was growing up, the only handicap you would see was time handicap. Basically, somebody who is better at chess playing against somebody who is weaker at chess would give him, let's say, two to five uh, or uh, one to five odds in a blitz game. And and you read about all those uh, you know historical games where people would give rook odds or knight odds or something, and. Th Honestly, I have no idea how they did that. But m more pertinently, I'm trying to speak quickly here because it's, you know there's such a lot of uh, stuff to get through. But basically, I've had an experience of, uh, in, I think it was about a year and a half ago or so. Basically, I played an older gentleman who sought me out and uh, we met up with the specific purpose of playing uh, a game of chess. And I assumed it will be some kind of a blitz game where I will give him time odds. And we, we met up, and there was no clock, and he suggested I give him pawn and move with black. 
and uh, both games were drawn. I think first with white and then with black. Both games were drawn, and very few games in my career were as much hard work as those were. I, I mean, he was a very decent player. It turned out very, very soon it became obvious that he is quite decent. But still, I did not expect it to be so difficult to play without the F7 pawn. Again, somebody who, once again, I don't know how to translate these things into ratings, but I guess he's something like 2100. And uh, when I saved that second game with black, I felt like I've actually achieved something in life. <laughs> so handicaps, you know, once you progress from time handicaps, which are really not exerting for me at all. I mean, I, I might lose some games if I uh, sort of o o o over expect, you know, overestimate my chances and give, let's say, one to five against somebody who is a good blitz player. But this is not taxing at all. It's perfectly normal. But once you go into material handicap, uh, you know, all bets are off. Because I think we've lost this culture. Nobody knows how to do this anymore. Uh, who you fun? Number two, who you fun? What do you think about who you fun? I think she's a fantastic player. Whether she would win a match against Polgar or not, if it started tomorrow, I have no idea. But I think uh, it will be very, very close. <clears throat> Number three, chess in real life. Does chess help you to make strategic decisions in real-world situations? Once again, this answer will be familiar, familiar to, to some of you. And uh, in order to keep it slightly short, I will not go into huge detail. But basically, there was one situation in my life where I felt I have enough data uh, to make uh, a chess-like calculation of what will happen to me if I do certain things. And I have to say that it was a, it was a pretty funny result in a way, because the calculation turned out to be entirely correct. I thought, if I do this right now in about, let's say, a year to two years, this set of things will happen. And they did happen. But the, 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 where the funny bit comes in was I thought these things will happen and I will be fine with it. And they happened and I was destroyed for a while, barely able to function. So uh, you can sometimes calculate stuff in life, although I wouldn't suggest you do it on a regular basis, it's tricky. And I think I got lucky there, or perhaps I really did know such a lot about that particular situation that guessing what will happen was not that hard. But evaluating what will happen afterwards is difficult. And I think it's a bit of a professional deformation for chess players, because we do tend to uh, think chess is uh, you know, solvable and computable when really it isn't, because it's a game with incomplete information. Life, you mean? Well, yep, yeah, sorry, I'm sort of uh, over-talking this. Yeah, but, but basically, Chess uh, conditions you to think in those terms, whereas you know in, in life there are so many unknowables that you really shouldn't probably be uh, trying to solve it as a, as a chess puzzle. First of all, that and then we mentioned it's very hard to anticipate how you're going to feel about stuff yeah, or but, how but, other people but, but, but that, that actually, stuff. That, that actually was the, right? the, the, the biggest lesson out of, out of that, that whole life situation was that you know, I can be really, really proud of my calculating skills there, but the evaluation of the position was just so off. God. Okay. Anyway, downswings in chess uh, do exist. Never thought about quitting. Uh, don't really know how to do anything else. Um, what game do you recommend him to study on the weekend? Because it is full of beautiful ideas and twists. Basically a chess game with a plot. I have no idea what he's talking about. No, uh, with a plot exciting as the plot of basic instincts. Uh, yeah. Uh, are we talking about board games or I'm not? He's asking for a specific chess game, the Immortal game. Ah, hmm. This is uh, interesting. Once again, the one that comes to mind somehow is 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 always the the Ivanchuk Yusupov game from Brussels '91. Somehow, as you know, the, nice game. yeah, as as the one striking game uh, you will really enjoy playing through. Actually, both game seven and game eight of this match are fantastic. Uh, people forget about game eight or possibly game seven. I forget. I think the black one was came first, and then there was a the white one. What was the white one? The Nimzo Indian E3. Some kind of E3 B3. Oh. That was also, I think, stunningly beautiful. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there are many others. It's just the one that I generally tend to remember, the, remember first. <clears throat> Thank you, KTU. Let's move on to Benson. Good evening, Grandmaster Swidler. I have a lot of favorite chess players, but of these wonderful people, you are the only one that belongs to the absolute world elite. 
Every press conference, etc., etc., with you is always a treat. Thanks. He's also a big fan of Tom Waits since 1987. Very, very hard to pick for all of us. I would use ages to ponder about it. I don't have One ages. One album yeah. of this that stands out the most in your heart and mind. Uh, it's banned from Trondheim in Norway. As Bent knows himself, it's uh, you, you know it's one of those you can't really answer. So you just pick one at random and, and stick with it. Uh, basically, uh, the first ever Waits album that was given to me by by my good friend Maxim Notkin. Shout out to Maxim if he uh, uh, happens to be watching this. Uh, uh, that was during the Moscow Olympiad in '94, and that was Frank's Wild Years, and that started the whole Tom Waits thing for me. And uh, I don't know if it's still my favorite album, but uh, it's the one I remember the most fondly, I think, because, because it was the first one and it made such a huge impression. Uh, definitely some of, the, uh, some of the, 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 the older stuff. Not that I don't like his current stuff, but uh, some of the classical ones uh, for, from, uh, let's say, 70s, early 80s. Lion Ping is asking, Dear Mr. Swidler, you're one of the greatest chess players for the last 20 years, in my opinion. Tell me one thing. How is it possible for you to keep so many or any variations of your white opening repertoire in your mind and use the right one during a game? Me as an amateur, I only succeed in remembering a few lines and play my openings more after opening principles when my opponent forces me into a line I have no idea about. Thanks and all the best for your upcoming tournaments. Best regards, Michael. Michael. Well, uh, uh, if you've watched, you know, any of the top-level press conference after the, you know, over the past, I don't know, two, three, five years, you will know that um, uh, top players complain a lot about not being able to remember their own analysis over the board, and it's a it's a huge concern for all of us, and uh, I'm no exception, but. Generally speaking, uh, especially if you're talking about your own analysis, if you've done some analysis with the machine, or if you asked a friend to look at something for you, and he, I'm sorry, and he sends you the files, those are harder. But if if this is something you've been working on, let's say on and off, because most of uh, the analysis of my machine is not, you know, a product of a single session. It's something which you uh, initially analyze for a bit and then expand on and expand on and expand on over the course of many years, especially with openings you play all your life. Let's say my Grunfeld files, I'm sure they started as, you know, brief notes somewhere in the mid-90s. And by now some of them are, you know, those huge monsters which have to be broken into parts. But what I'm trying to say is uh, you keep on looking at the same stuff. And uh, if it doesn't stick in your mind, something is, is badly wrong with your memory simply. It's just at some point it becomes a part of you to a degree. Uh, but uh, you still are forced to play according to opening principles when you're caught out of, uh, of theory. And this happens uh, more and more often because, uh, first of all, it's uh, much harder. Still, of course, it's true that it's very, very hard to keep all this in your, hand, uh, in your head unless you uh, repeated it directly before the game. And also people are preparing and trying to surprise you. All right, thanks a lot. Um, do we have any more questions? Is this all there is? We need a last question. I'm trying to think of a smart question. But all I ever ask you about is about TV series, really. I like this bottom one. but hmm. Which one? Oh, Mark Twick. No, but he's not no, a premium no. member. Or is he? he I've no, is. I have no idea, but there's a question which starts, how mad are Jan and Peter? Even if it's not, <laughs> even if it's not from a premium member, I think, I think it deserves a response. We are well yeah, mad. We're having fun. We are well mad. Just hungry. Mm. I think that's all there is. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Peter, for staying with us and for the insightful answers. I hope at least some of them were half decent, and uh, I, I definitely enjoyed it. But then again, I always uh, enjoy speaking <laughs> on any subject. I learned some stuff for sure. I hope so do you guys. Once again, we're very sorry we could not do this live. We will try to repeat it at some point. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the show, and thanks a lot, Peter Swidler. Thanks, Best Jan. of luck in Bilbao, where you're going next, right? Yeah, soonish.
Thanks, everybody. That's it for today. Bye-bye.